Hello everybody, welcome to today's webinar. My name is Kimberly, and I've been with the RTA for over 10 years. I'm an accredited mediator and have over eight years experience in conflict resolution. Most recently, I've been working in training and quality with the RTA frontline staff. I have an extensive understanding of common tenancy issues, common disagreements, and how owners, tenants, and agents can see things differently. Now, starting productive conversations and maintaining good relationships with your tenant or property manager or property owner is vital throughout a tenancy. In dispute situations where priorities and perspectives differ, it can be challenging to find ways to diffuse the situation, keep communication channels open and address the issue successfully. I'm here today to provide you with an insight into common tenancy disputes, causes of conflict in tenancies that we see here at the RTA and provide you with some practical tips for navigating difficult tenancy conversations. Now what's on for today? My goal for today is that you will gain a better understanding of conflict to help you have better conversations when it comes to those tricky tenancy topics. I have interactive polls along the way to guide you um, or to guide my conversations and to help make the content more relevant. Now at the RTA, we know most tenancies run smoothly. Today is really about sharing insights into a range of common tenancy disagreements and providing an objective and perspective and practical tips to help you handle and resolve issues more confidently. Now, it is always recommended that you seek independent legal advice for specific tenancy issues. So I'm gonna start, we do this um, at every webinar. I'm just gonna gauge who I've got out there in the audience today. I'll launch that poll. You should see that on your screen now. This just gives me an idea of who's out there. Figures are still changing there. I'll leave it open for a moment longer. Okay, I'm gonna close that poll off now. Brilliant, so we've got um, a representation across a number of groups there, um, property managers and landlords, and we've got others from community support organisations, etc. Hello again out to there to all of you. Now the biggest driver in communication, I'll close up that poll. Should have been closed, let's have a look here. Looks as though it's still appearing on your screen. What's going on? Can everybody see the slide there? Got some technical difficulties. We've never had this happen before. I might try and share that poll and then see if no slide. Thanks guys. Thanks for um, answering me out there. I'll share it and then see if that will close it off your screen. Got the poll results. Okay. All right. Might shop stop sharing the screen for a moment and see if that kicks it back into gear. One moment. Okay, I might try again. We'll see if we can flick across. I'll flick through the screens. Not too sure. Bear with me one moment. There we go, we're back online. Thanks everybody for your patience. Gotta love technology, hey? Okay, now the biggest driver of dispute resolution requests over the past three years has been bond disputes and claims above the bond. And that's around 65% of dispute cases received at the RTA. Now at the RTA, we always encourage self-resolution as the first option, but we do appreciate it's not always possible to resolve every tenancy issue on your own. And we understand that there are situations outside of your control. And that's why the RTA's free and impartial dispute resolution service exists. Now, our conciliators do not determine who's right or wrong, and they cannot make decisions about disputes and or even enforce rules or regulations. 
The process itself is voluntary and we people cannot be compelled to take part. But the good news is, as you can see on your screen, that the RTA conciliators resolve 70% of dispute cases where parties participate, which is great news for those of you who need support in this space. Now, I just want you to stop for a moment. Think about your most recent tenancy dispute experience or a tenancy related conflict. What impact did it have on you? What impact did it maybe have on the business, your health, your reputation, work-life balance, or even on your relationships? Could there have been one thing you could have said differently, done differently, or thought about differently that could have saved you time, stress, and even money? Today, I'm here to help you find another tool or another strategy, that one extra thing that could help you avoid disputes and resolve disagreements. Just got a lag here in terms of the slides. There we go, they're coming up again, great. Okay, so the diagram on your screen there that you should be able to see breaks down the types of disputes received at the RTA. Now we find the large percentage of bond claims are often the culmination of unresolved or unaddressed issues throughout the tenancy, or they are a result of a lack of communication at the end of the tenancy. Now, having the conversations in the lead up to the end of the tenancy, including a clear outline of others' intentions and the processes that should or will be followed, can save time and will lead to more agreements. Discussions about a bond refund and any claims or differences in opinion should be had before either party lodges the bond. And look, in my experience, guys, lodging a bond refund just to get in first more often than not jeopardizes the relationship, okay? It leads to disputes that could have potentially been avoided. No one likes hearing about the submission of a bond refund from the RTA rather than from the other party to the bond. It generally just gets people offside right away. Now, as if finding the right words isn't hard enough, there are many barriers to communication as well. And I've listed a few there on your screen. Take a bit of a read. Something to consider is your environment. If you're in a busy, loud office, are you actually hearing correctly? Can you be heard? Remember simple things such as asking a person is now a good time to chat can help set the right tone for the conversations. The other party might be an area with poor phone reception. They may not have access to the agreement, to the internet, or they may be at work. Conversations really ideally need to take place in a mutually agreed time, okay? Um, and not when one person is busy or distracted. When people feel ambushed or at a point where they feel they have no other choice but to say yes, things can become problematic. Now, emotions are another big barrier. Have you moved house lately? It's a nightmare and it's really, really stressful. Tenants, try keeping your emotions in check or be honest about how you're feeling and maybe preference, hey, I might be coming across as, as, a, as rushed or a bit pushy at the moment. Agents, owners, avoid um, you know, becoming desensitised to what really is your daily norm. Put up a picture or a prompter maybe on your desk to keep things in perspective for you when you're dealing with tenants. Remind each other in the office. So I've listed some common barriers that we observe in tenancy disputes. Take a read. Now, lack of rapport and trust is a big one. Of course, the better the rapport and trust, the more likely the success of a difficult conversation. Where there are no feelings of, say, hidden agendas or a power or interest struggle, um, open and honest conversations really can flourish. Now, I understand in your industry, it really can be hard to establish um, rapport and trust. You often have little to do with each other initially. Then the tenancy plays out. You don't really speak to each other again until there's a difficult conversation to be had or a serious issue. How do you reconnect again? Be mindful of re-establishing that rapport when you re-engage with the other person. But my best advice, guys, look, would really be to always be yourself. 
don't be one person at sign up and a different person when you need to have that difficult conversation. Set or confirm expectations and always do what you say you're going to do. Lack of information and knowledge, another big one. Now, knowledge and information opens up choices, it opens up your options, and it really does open up communication lines. The amount of conversations we hear with customers on a daily basis where they haven't spoken to the other party to get an idea of where they stand. They haven't reviewed their tenancy agreement or even reflected on the timeline of events before lodging a dispute. In bond disputes, we see people claiming bonds before, where, before there's a discussion even had about the exit condition of the home. Now, in terms of poor communication skills, we know communication can be verbal, it can be in writing. A lot of the time we see it's um, due to a lack of following up with the other person and just simply keeping them up to date. Now, we're gonna talk more about communication and assumptions and avoidance now. If avoidance. Now, avoidance is really any actions a person takes to escape from difficult thoughts and feelings. Now, these behaviours can occur in many different ways and may include actions that a person does or does not do. When we avoid difficult conversations, it really does lead to dis disagreements. It leads to a loss of rapport or a breakdown in the relationship. Now, some consequences can be direct and some are more indirect. Now we know the great news about avoiding things is there, there might be short-term relief, okay? You might feel an immediate relief from stress or workload pressures, but the long-term consequences really do outweigh those short-term gains. Now getting to the bottom of avoidance really will help you navigate your approach moving forward. The more you tackle these little things, the more confidence you grow, and hopefully you'll break a habit or really just better understand your triggers that could be causing your conflict or avoidance. So on your screen, I've listed the common tenancy discussions that we find are most likely to be avoided. These issues not discussed become a catalyst for disputes seen at the RTA. I'm just going to launch a poll and I just really want to find out in your experience, what types of tenancy conversations have you found to be the most challenging? So I know that you all know your rights and obligations or how to find the information, but often our emotions, fears and triggers can lead to our actions or our inactions. I so often hear, well, they didn't say anything about it the whole tenancy or, oh, I've overlooked so many things, this really isn't fair. The main thing to remember is to not avoid having those conversations up front. Tackle the issues or the tasks that you're avoiding in real time and be consistent. This is the key. I'm going to close off that poll now. Let's take a look at what some of you are feeling out there in terms of what you're finding to be the most challenging. I'll close that off there. I might share that poll for you on your screen. Ah, yes, I can see the first one there in terms of, um, it's a big one here and I find it is really, um, as I said, the catalyst for bond disputes in the end. So 31% of you are saying that the entry condition report differences at the start of a tenancy are often um, something that you find most challenging. And I think um, it would be fair to say, a lot of this is because you're time poor. So you've moved people in, you've done your start of a tenancy, you've signed them all up, and often then it, you know, it's, you're moving on to the next. And often this is really where you need to stop um, and consider that really, if you can't agree in the beginning or you don't come to an agreement, how are you going to agree in the end? It's about stopping and really focusing on this. And I know it's easier said than done, Try maybe even just going out to the property. Are you going round in circles on the phone with the other person? Go out to the property. Seek to understand that difference in opinion firsthand. Now, if you, if you do this and you reach an agreement, document the agreement or the changes. You don't have to do a whole new report again and get everybody to sign it. Attach the relevant details or the agreement to the signed entry condition report and just get everybody to initial and sign, et cetera. Agents, talk to your owners. 
be upfront with them with relation to the changes and fair wear and tear that happens within a home. Don't let them get a nasty surprise when they get an entry condition report and they see a tenant's comments, okay? Also too, I know another one is the entry condition um, for a new tenant or a new owner, I should say. I know that sometimes it's hard to have um, a conversation around the cleanliness of a home with a new owner who's cleaned the property themselves. It's really hard to have that conversation with them and say, hey, look, um, you know, this is kind of our standard that as a baseline. But really talking from experience here, avoiding that conversation is not going to, to help anybody. And certainly, um, you know, you might be worried about having that conversation up front, but then, um, you know, it, it will lead to disagreements in terms of the condition of the property with your tenants. And this will continue to evolve over time the more tenancies you have if you're not starting from that clean slate in the beginning. It's always the best, no matter what, to agree on, the, on clean in the beginning. It sets those expectations. Now, tenants, advice for you out there, only write what is not already on the report. Otherwise, if you're duplicating information, the key differences may be overlooked and therefore not addressed. Okay, that's a really big one there. I'm sure property managers and owners out there, you'll agree. Okay, so I'm gonna close that poll now. We'll see, hopefully it'll flick across. Yes, our PowerPoint is working again. That's great news. Okay, so did you actually know that our brains are designed to make assumptions? So our brain searches for patterns, predictability, and the reason why it does this is because ultimately, if they can find a predictability or an existing pathway or pattern, it saves your brain energy. Assumptions essentially are our filters based on our knowledge and past experiences. Our brain tells us to determine something is likely or true without actually having ev any evidence that it is. And we know that there are, there are reasons, um, good reasons for making assumptions or um, you know, acting quickly and, and, and things like that. But in terms of this with relation to tenancies and, re and relationships, it's really important to recognize these situations and challenge your thoughts. Assumptions really can block possibilities for coming up for new suggestions and can create a spiral of negative thinking. I really think the best way to avoid assumptions is to remain open-minded and not jump to conclusions. And always remember, no two tendencies are exactly the same. Now, most of you would have heard of the tip of an iceberg analogy. The bulk of an iceberg's mass is below the water's surface. Like icebergs, we really um, have a lot going on beneath the surface. And what we see or hear is usually just a smaller chunk of the underlying issues. So when communicating, consider what is under the surf surface. And this could be for you or for the other person. Taking your communication and listening skills to that next level can decrease your chances of conflict dramatically. And you may have heard that saying, seek first to understand and then be understood. We all think that we're good listeners, okay? But most of us really listen with the intent to be heard rather than the intent to actually hear. This really is a skill, believe me, it is harder than it sounds, but try it today. And remember, it takes practice. Actively seeking to understand the root of the problem really will, um, help you understand the person's point of view, which in turn helps you better respond with purpose, okay? And by seeking to understand, it really does, um, you know, maintain the trust with the other person that you are putting in the effort to understand what's going on for them. Of course, certainly you're not counsellors. The main thing I'm wanting you to take away from here is just to be present in your communications and seek to understand first. Okay, so in terms of communication and more so in disputes, language is more important than you probably even realise. So what we say and the words that we use can trigger a person or they may just have a different meaning to another person and that depends on what's underneath their iceberg. At the RTA, we work with our frontline staff to be mindful of how they use words and we tell them um, to understand that their words can keep a person positional, or they can neutralize a situation and calm a person. 
Now on your screen, you can see some very common words. I'm sure we all use them on a daily basis. Now, where you can sense that conflict is likely or a topic or a person is particularly sensitive, focusing on your language can really help have better conversations and avoid that com conflict or that emotional reaction. In terms of dispute resolution, we find the word damage, for example, can trigger a tenant. Subconsciously, we think damage is malicious. It, it's, we can't help it. It's just the path our brain goes down. But really, what we know is damage can be accidental, right? So for example, if you're talking about stains on a carpet, where they're concerned, saying something like, I notice the carpets are marked, as opposed to the carpets are damaged, can avoid feelings of shame or embarrassment for the tenant. Another big one in conversations, I'm sure you're all um, privy to, is the conversation around the cleanliness of the home. So just a few tips, avoid using words like filthy and dirty. You could switch it up, try something like, um, it's common that in some areas of the home, they require more attention than others. Or you could just say something like, the oven requires a wipe over. Science tells us that we really are proud creatures and our reputation or our status is really important to us. Now, I'm gonna launch another poll. I wanna find out what's the biggest thing that stops you from having difficult conversations. I'll launch that poll now. So we know when it comes to difficult conversations, it's really um, where you feel there's going to be a difference in opinion or a clash of values, okay? It really is important to start with the end in mind. Consider what is your desired outcome? What are you hoping to achieve? What is your key message? What do you want to achieve? Is there wriggle room? Is there negotiation? Consider your communication methods and the barriers. Now, remember, there are always pros and cons to say, for example, SMS, email, phone communications, face-to-face -face communications. But did you know that only 7% of communication is verbal? Humans actually put more emphasis on what we observe, the non-verbal communication. So for example, your facial expressions, body language, gestures, eye contact, movement. Your communication method that you choose is really important. So remember when you're communicating in writing, we're not citing a person. We humans are left to assume the intention, the tone and the message. You could, for example, follow up a conversation with an email for your records, rather than maybe using emails as your go-to all the time. Let's take a look. I'll share that poll there for you now. Okay, so I can see here, one of the biggest um, concerns there, or biggest thing that stops you from having difficult conversations with you, we can see 54% of you out there, is that you're afraid the conversation's going to lead to an argument. And I guess that comes down to your, your um, feelings of the rapport or um, are you considering your past experiences with the person? Are you making assumptions? Is it one of those tricky tenancy conversations? Um, and of course, practicing these skills, as I'm mentioning today, will give you com um, confidence. But the more you jump in, the more you're gonna be able to better navigate these situations. Um, and maybe even your fear of confrontation will diminish over time or dissolve, okay? My overall tips essentially really is if you're planning your conversations and you're considering your past interactions or how the other party might receive the message, it's going to help. So have an action plan. Clear any obvious communication barriers. So, um, you know, think about your time of day, your method. And don't forget, you can always reconvene, okay? But in terms of where you're afraid that the argument's going to lead, the conversation's going to lead to an argument, you know, um, if you feel that it's really coming down to a loss of rapport or trust um, or a breakdown in the communication, really just be honest, clear the air, seek an agreement to move forward. You could say something like, oh, Ben, look, I acknowledge there really has been some issues during the tenancy. We really do have a continuing relationship and I'm hopeful we can put that aside and move forward. Um, I do need to have a conversation with you today. Remember, are you making assumptions based on your past interactions? Don't forget to challenge them. 
Okay, think outside the box. If you if you've challenged your your assumptions and you really do believe that this person may be just to have an argumentative personality type, could you speak with the other tenant or the other um, partner or owner? Okay, um, could the wife be um, a better able to assist? Could another property manager have more success in the conversation? Think outside the box. And of course, aggression or abuse is never acceptable. Okay, but a difference in opinion is nothing to be afraid of. If anything, try to see it as a challenge. Okay, outline the differences. Be upfront. We both see it differently. Okay, um, but if we want these issues to be resolved, then it's going to maybe take compromise and negotiation. I'm prepared for that. Are you? Okay, simple things like that and really just being upfront and honest is the best approach. Okay, so we've talked about planning your communication. Now we're going to look at, I'll just hide that poll there and hopefully you'll have the screen back up. Okay, so during the conversation, let's have a look here. During the conversation, oh, what's going on with our slides? Oh, it's back up and running again. So most importantly, being conscious at the time, um, you know, is especially of your barriers, your environment, okay? Is it an appropriate time? Have a think about it. It might be appropriate, but as conversations transpire, you know, um, someone enters the office or the, um, the tenant's children might have come in from school or something like that, okay? Always um, clarify what you hear, okay? Clarify what you're hearing, clarify the message. Are you hearing it with the um, intention that it really was supposed to be heard? Focus on the positives and the future, okay? Keep focusing on the positives. There's always positives to a situation, okay? The positive might be just actually having the conversation and coming together with a commitment to resolve it, okay? Stay future focused. And always remember, don't end the conversation without an action plan. Now, if emotions start to run high, don't be afraid to acknowledge it and reaffirm that you're interested in reaching the outcomes together. And for that reason, you would like to pick up again, okay? Pick up later when everyone's had some space. Now, lastly, always do what you say you will and document that outcome. So we've looked at the common causes of tenancy disputes. We've looked at the barriers, including avoidance and assumptions. And we've looked at the best practice when it comes to planning your communication and your methods and styles. The benefits really are endless, but don't forget that today is about taking away a few insights and reminders and blending them into your daily practices in life and in work, okay? And really, um, it's about not forgetting to use your resources, okay? Listen to understand. Consider your communication. Don't forget to challenge those assumptions. Your brain will make assumptions naturally. Get to the bottom of why you might avoid, might be avoiding things and practice, practice, practice. If all else fails, there's always the RTA dispute resolution as an option, okay? In most cases, we know the legislation is not specific and it really is up to each other to communicate, negotiate and compromise. Okay, so I'm just having a look here. We've got 29 minutes on the clock. I am conscious that we're all very busy um, and you're probably allowed 30 minutes or so. Um, we have had a few comments and questions coming through today. Um, so we might have a minute or so. I'll just reflect there, have a bit of a thought. Um, of course, there's resources on our website Website today if, if um, there are some other burning questions that you have or you can give our contact centre a call. I'll just have a little bit of a look at some of the um, thoughts and um, comments that have come through today. So we've had some um, we've had some people commenting on um, you know a, a big challenge which really is around maybe um, feuding lessors and tenants. Okay, so um, that's where the tenants and owners are basically the bump maybe become positional, and you're essentially a, if you're an agent the meat and the sandwich. I guess um, you know I, I guess the thing there is really getting to um, 
uh, getting to the bottom of, of the where the conflict between the two um, lie. Okay, being upfront and honest and reminding each party that if they're seeking an outcome, possibly the way that they're going about it, um, you know, that that outcome may not be achieved. Remembering too, the biggest thing I think is, is um, as a property manager or that person in the middle is acting as a buffer, okay? If either a party are acting on emotions, okay, or they're positional, um, try working on taking back those messages, um, you know, uh, you know, in a, in a softer way, remembering that soft and hard language, okay? Um, and, and maybe having those honest conversations with um, your owner and saying, hey, look, you've employed me here as a professional to provide you with my um, professional experience, um, my take on things. Um, you know, I feel that really, you know, um, you're wanting me to act on this. My experience say, says, okay, or refer them to other resources. We've got someone out there asking, what is the claim greater than the bond? So that's where um, sometimes uh, parties are seeking money that um, that it goes over the bond amount. So you might, um, as a property manager or an owner, the bond may be $1,000 and you may feel that, um, you know, you've got monies outstanding for a number of different items. It could be some repairs to the property, carpet replacement, what have you, um, that goes above um, that thousand dollar bond. Okay, so that will often come in. Those bond um, uh, claims that are above the bond will come in generally around the same time um, as a bond dispute, so that um, you know people are hoping to have those discussions um, included in the bond dispute conciliation process. Uh, another one we might wrap up shortly. Um, I, I, this is a big one too. What happens when the other person refuses to speak to you? I guess that's really frustrating when you're trying to keep that channel, um, communication channel um, open and the other person's refusing to, to deal with you. I guess um, it's pretty obvious um, that there's a, a, there's a lack of trust or a breakdown in the relationship and often it comes to, you know, um, the rapport. Okay, so airing that up front is really, you know, look, it appears that something has occurred where we, you know, our, our relationship has broken down. Okay, acknowledge that you may have an existing relationship. How are we going to get through this? Okay, and remember what I said, sometimes it's really necessary to proceed through to dispute resolution for that impartial third party to come in and try to um, assist with restoring that relationship or um, assist parties with achieving an outcome on a particular issue. Okay, ask them, would they prefer to deal with another person? Okay, if this is possible, is there someone else in the office that they could, um, they would um, be open to dealing with? Um, and also maybe reconsider, you know, your, your, your methods. I find often just asking the person where it's safe to do so, getting them, um, you know, in um, as a last sort of ditch attempt, just getting them in and having any kind of conversations in person, okay? That's where they're going to see all of those non-verbal communications. If you're genuine, if your intent is clear and very obvious, they're going to, um, you know, hopefully you're going to be able to change that perspective or build up that rapport and trust again. And as I said, don't forget, dispute resolution is okay. Okay, so I think we're probably going to have to wrap it up there. Um, I hope that uh, you have all, um, as I said, taken away. One of my objectives was taken away one or two insights to be able to blend into your day-to-day um, -day life. Um, it does wrap up our webinar. Now, all of our webinars, as I said earlier, um, they're on our website and we now have weekly podcasts, which is really exciting. Um, if you do have any more specific questions, as I said, give our um, contact centre a call. Um, now, when I end the webinar, um, there will be a quick, I promise it's quick, three question survey. Um, so that um, basically I end the webinar and if you can just stay on, on um, uh, the webinar link, a survey will pop up. Um, but I did want to mention um, essentially before I go today that we know that it is really an uncertain and challenging time for everyone in the Queensland rental sector right now with COVID-19 and many people needing to isolate. Now more than ever, we ask everyone to be mindful and respectful of each other and communicate as early as possible. Please stay safe and take care. I will now end the webinar.